Welcome viewers to MOOC's online course on Introduction to Modern Western Art. This is the last lecture of the third week dedicated to the study of modern sculpture. And in this lecture today, we will be looking at the phenomenon of outdoor sculpture and public art. Now, outdoor sculpture or having sculpture outside the a building or a gallery is nothing very new. We have seen that happening in the ancient period. We have seen that happening in the medieval period, in Gothic period, in Renaissance period. So what is new about having sculpture outside in the modern art? That is what we are going to see today. First of all, public sculpture or outdoor sculpture in the traditional art, where usually more often than not happened to be commissioned art. They were commissioned by the patron, either by the church authority or by a rich person who wanted to have what we call a statue. So usually in ancient times, in medieval time, or generally speaking in the traditional art, outdoor sculpture got equated with the statue or the idea of a monument. But I think the first sculptor to have ever thought of having installing a sculpture completely outside any building or gallery right in the heart of nature was Henry Moore. In fact, some of the sculptures by Rada can also be seen installed outside. But it is not so site specific. I mean, Rada's huge outdoor sculptures could be placed in another location as well. They can be moved to some other place without really disturbing the essence of that sculpture. But in case of Henry Moore, if Henry Moore has decided to install his famous sculpture called the King and the Queen on a small hillock somewhere in North England in a beautiful natural setup. I am sure that he had that setting in his mind not only when he was making the sculpture, but also when he was conceptualizing the sculpture. In that sense, a new idea came into being in the history of modern sculpture to give a new character to the outdoor sculpture. And that idea is called site-specific outdoor sculpture. Apart from that, there are quite a few variations evident from the whole practice of outdoor sculpture and public art. For example, if people like Rada or Henry Moore have always thought about their sculpture in terms of a very permanent and durable material, we also have something like this. Not only that, the location is itself nature, very raw and almost primordial nature, but look at the material with which this particular construction has been made. The material itself has been derived from nature like twigs or tree branches. And hence, the durability of the work is in question. It is quite a favorite practice now, even today amongst many sculptors all over the world, to create a work of art out of the materials available in nature and leave the work in nature. So it is not only about impermanency of the material, it is also about this whole idea that the work itself may disappear after some time. The work itself 
is subject to decay and the work is certainly having an expiry date of its own. But what is important apart from this temporariness of these works is the fact that these artists in contrast to constructivists and all or minimalists, these artists who are working outdoor making outdoor sculptures with natural materials, they are opposed to any material that is either prefabricated or a byproduct of industrial growth. So, you have the work in nature, you leave the work in nature and you have made the work with materials collected from nature like this one as well or this one. Now, throughout the world if you look at the contemporary art scenario not only of Europe or America, but if you look at the global art scenario because of the recent consciousness regarding environment and nature, because of this very urgent idea to make art eco friendly and nature friendly. Many artists all over the world now have stopped using industrial materials and exploring the possibilities of making artworks. They do not even call or use the term sculpture, they are calling it artworks. So, they are looking at the possibilities of making artworks out of natural materials without destroying the nature, without inflicting any damage on the nature. And then you also have this very user friendly kind of sculptures, but located in nature or maybe in a park, where once again like Alexander Calder's works, these sculptures do not have any serious or overloading conceptual or physical I mean philosophical content. They are light hearted, but at the same time they are also a kind of statement about how one relates oneself with nature through a work of art like this or like this. These are obviously not real mushrooms, they are like images of mushrooms created with again earthy materials like clay and installed in a way that the work almost submits itself to the nature to the ground. And please note that works of this kind do not have or rather do not need to have any pedestal. That is also very interesting, they are directly rooted or installed in the ground. And when you have a huge kind of artwork right on the earth itself, that kind of work is not only site specific, it is also called land art. Oh, look at this one. Somebody has simply collected pebbles of various kinds of various shapes and arranged the pebbles in a way that they create a visual or visually delightful form. And if you look at the tail portion of the construction, you will see how the density of the arrangement of the pebbles is getting reduced to the extent that it evokes a feeling that you are letting the pebbles go back to the nature from where it came from. So, there is a continuous attempt at relating the outdoor sculptures located in nature with the nature itself. In that sense, in modern art and contemporary art, artists who are working in nature they are not using nature only as a context, but they are trying to 
give back the work to the nature. Now on the other hand, we have a wonderful practice in outdoor sculptures in an urban situation, in the context of a city space like this. And of course, Alexander Calder should be remembered once again for having installed some most beautiful outdoor sculptures in an urban space like this one. So, Alexander Calder's works, one feels, is very suitable in a given situation like this, in an urban space. It could be also looking very wonderful in the natural space, but going by the um, present day kind of approach to artworks in nature, any kind of use of industrial materials would uh, come under severe criticism. You also have this kind of outdoor sculptures, which are simply huge enlargements of extremely ordinary and common objects like a clip or a feather cock, but once they are hugely enlarged and magnified in scale and installed in a particular place, they assume neither the status of a sculpture nor the status of a monument, but an artwork which is delightful. Delightful not in a derogatory sense, not in a superficial sense, but significantly this sense of delight in sculpture was uh, something that many early 20th century modern artists were not interested in. If you look at the works by Giacometti once again, definitely his works are not delightful. His works are supposed to evoke a sense of anxiety, but these works are supposed to evoke a sense of delight and fun like this one as well. Some of these outdoor sculptures or artworks are meant to be interactive. I mean, it is not just to be seen, but these works are to be interacted with in terms of either walking through the sculpture or passing by or touching or maybe even using the sculptures as functional objects like furnitures or benches to sit on. And this is how in the public space like in a city square or on a railway platform or in front of a shopping mall, sculptures and particularly figurative sculptures become the companions, your friends, a human companion. And this once again extends the functional value of sculpture when you see them in the public space. So, outdoor works and public arts, they have some functions, some values which are beyond their immediate aesthetic appeal. And particularly when you think of that how common people and public get engaged with a sculpture like this, then of course, we realize that how the whole definition of sculpture is getting expanded, is having different layers of usability and at the same time it is becoming more and more appealing to a large number of people irrespective of whether you are trained in looking at art or not.
So, a sculpture of this kind in a city square may not have a deep and intense conceptual content, but it can be a simply a delightful structure, a delightful object to look at and thereby enhancing the visual environment of an otherwise dull and monotonous cityscape. Look at how with hundreds of umbrellas hanging on the top can change the environment below of a pathway in a city. So, already we have seen how the idea of sculpture has expanded itself, how the idea of sculpture has redefined itself, not only by adding and experimenting with new materials, but also by allowing a new concept of sculpture, which cannot be called a sculpture anymore, but it is so fluid in terms of its original contest content, that we do not call it a sculpture, but we do not feel hesitant to call it an artwork. Alexander Calder once again, one more. Now, this is an interesting work, where the work seems to have got integrated with nature despite the fact that these parts in this work, in this sculpture are made out of steel or industrial product, yet visually it does not really disturb the natural environment. So, that is again a possibility. Then somebody like Christo made this famously known as valley curtain in Colorado, USA in 1972 literally hanging a huge curtain across a valley. So, the point now is not to debate on whether it can be called a sculpture or not. The point is whether you can accept this as a work of art or not. If you cannot, you should have your argument why it is not. If you can, then still you have to say, why you think it could be considered as a work of art, and why history of art has accepted Christo's works like this, this valley curtain, or Christo and Jean Claude, it is a collaborative work between them, Christo with Jean Claude, made a huge installation of hundreds of umbrellas in California and Tejon Ranch, he, they made this in 1991 and it was a huge project and once again, of course, you are looking at it, if you are trying to think of this work and discussing this work from the point of view of um, the traditional notion of what a sculpture should be, then this work is certainly not going to satisfy you. But along with the history of modern art, if we are able to make ourselves and our perceptual ability as flexible as the artwork itself, if we are to, if we are able to kind of redefine our own expectations from an artwork, I am sure a work like this by Christo will surely not only satisfy us, but will enable us to enjoy more different kinds of artworks, which are absolutely different from the typical artworks that we see inside a gallery or inside a traditional building. So, conceptually speaking and of course, materially, sculpture or the idea of a work of art 
has gone through some radical changes in mid 20th century. For example, when Christo wraps up this whole building called Reichstag in Berlin, it is this wrapping of a building, this old traditional building which is the center of the power, German power, itself became a work of art for a few days or a few weeks as long as it was there and hundreds and thousands of people came to see also because it was a spectacular sight. And definitely when somebody wraps up a whole huge government and official building with synthetic cloth and then of course, we cannot say that he is creating a sculpture, but definitely he is creating a work of art. And if you are still not happy with this word artwork, let us say Christo is creating a new visual statement and definitely it is contextual and definitely it created a huge visual impact on the viewers who came to see that spectacle. Now, outdoor sculptures have, will have usually one or many of these following features. Number one, they might be permanently installed in a specific site, also known as site specific sculpture. Outdoor sculptures may be integrally related with nature and earth and hence this kind of sculptures are subject to the changes in nature. In fact, they are also known as land art. Third, temporary works for a limited period of time. Plenty of such works are happening now all over the world in outdoor or in public space where a certain work of art or a sculpture is kept only for a few days. Once it is removed, not only the context, but even the relevance of that work of art is lost. In that case, we cannot call them a sculpture or cannot also have them uh, a very general term like artwork. We use a different terminology for that kind of work and it is called installation work. So, the temporary works for a limited period of time where non-permanent mediums are used intentionally to ensure its short life. There are many public art and outdoor works which are deliberately made non-permanent. Sculptures thus made a left to decay, disintegrate and disappear eventually. Fifth, there are a lot of outdoor works which are made interactive, where playfulness and a light hearted quality is the strong character of these works mainly to engage the public freely without any conceptual or physical baggage. So, you can see a sculpture like this where the inner form is basically made out of maybe clay or earth or stone, but what is important here is that the artist allow, the artist allows a moss to grow over the sculpture and this is where nature takes over because you cannot control that and the artist would not like to control the growth and spread of the moss on the sculpture. So, if your core sculpture is permanent and fixed, then what is happening over the sculpture is unpredictable, is non-permanent, it is changeable and it will provide new look to the sculpture with the changes in season. And lastly, we may look at a wonderful attempt at which has become very famous and a very recent work which happened just 
three years back in Birmingham, where a Brazilian sculptor, Nele Azevedo, arranged 5,000 little ice figurines on the steps of Chamberlain Square in Birmingham, England, to remember the men and women lost during World War I, including the civilians. The melting ghostly figures placed by volunteers created a truly haunting image and they were crowned by a red figure that seemed to drip a trail of blood down the steps. So first of all, the very idea to use ice as your medium for sculpture is extremely significant in the context of this work. Not that ice sculpture is something new. For many years, um, ice sculpture and competitions of ice sculptures is happening in many places in the world like China and other places. There are artists all over the world who are extremely kind of skillful in doing ice sculpture. But for them, once again, ice is visually a very different medium to work with, creating a very different translucent and a transparent effect. So, it is basically a technical and visual aspect of ice that appeals many sculptors. But what Nele Azevedo, the Brazilian sculptor is doing here is, she is exploring the very quality of ice, the tendency of ice to melt away once it is left in normal temperature. And that is what began to happen with her ice figurines. The sculptures began to melt away. The way hundreds and thousands of soldiers and civilians simply disappeared from this earth due to world war and generally speaking human violence and brutality. So, this is a very interesting piece of work where not only the context is public, but also the medium is ephemeral, also it is almost like a performance that it happens over a period of time and once all the figures get melted away, the sculpture is over like this. And before it gets completely over, what you see here is mutilated, deformed and decaying bodies. Thank you.